Must I change the thing? I was told that because we are from the same family, so don't have to change this thing. <laughs> yeah, we do look forward to the day where we don't have to do all these things and they're going to do with the vaccination. I'm going to be vaccinated soon, so I'm quite happy. <laughs> I was told that there's a trick for vaccination. Those of you who somehow wants to do it faster, you go to the vaccination centre one hour before they close. What will happen is that they are always looking for people who would take the leftover vaccine that some guy didn't turn up. So you will be called the soaker. You are the one who soak up every <laughs> leftovers. So try your luck if you want to. If you if they cannot find the soaker, they will call the army. <laughs> so the NS boys will be arrowed to come and take up all the soaking, soak up all the leftover stuff. Well, whatever the case is, I'm just thankful that we are moving towards the end of this. And already Phuket announced, right, July the 1st, uh, anybody who come with the vaccine don't have to be quarantined. I think that's a really wonderful thing to happen. Um, let's uh, look at our passage for today. And uh, <clears throat> as Yuin said, because in the coming week, uh, we are ending Lent, moving into Good Friday and Easter. And so today's passage, I want to gear it a little bit towards that direction. And, you know, the season of Lent is 40 days before Easter. And it's a time where we are to be reflective of the passion of Christ, the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Roman Catholic Church takes this very seriously. And so every year they have fasting, they have scripture, they do a lot of Things. Protestant churches tend not to uh, be so caught up with Lent, except maybe the Anglican Church. And some of the modern-day churches, they don't even bother with it at all. We are like somewhere in, in between. But I always find that it's important for us to be reflective of it. And so in today's sermon, we want to think a little bit further into this. And it's just nice also, by, by providence of God, Ephesians 2 uh, really is touching upon that that particular reason why we should have lands as well. So first, some advertisement. Again, daily devotional um, address is here. I want to move on to really encourage you guys to write. Some, A lot of you. Some of you contributed one or two. I'm sure you can do more. Write. It's an exercise for you to reflect upon what God is saying to you. The other one is, again, Catechism class will begin later at 11.30 and it, you don't have to want to be baptized to join this class and I've enjoyed teaching it very much so. So let's review what was taught in the last lesson. Last lesson we were at Ephesians 2 verses 4 to 10. Now if earlier when we started Ephesians 1 I told you that from verse 1 to verse 14 is the longest sentence in the whole of the Bible. This is possibly second longest or one of the longest as well because Ephesians chapter 2 from 1 to 10 is also one long sentence. So the Apostle Paul's thoughts are all very interlinked, although he touched on many, many different topics. But last week, I wanted to focus really on what sin is all about. Although it may seem obvious to us, but really we, you know, we are so used to some of this terminology that we don't really think deeper into it. And I took the theologian John Frame's idea to explain further. So he, he would uh, classify it as three different things. That really, when we live in the world, we ought to have the right standard, we ought to have the right goals, we ought to have the right motive. The problem is with sin is it becomes the false standard, the false goal, and the false motive. And then I went through them one by one. When we say the right standard means God's word. God's word and God's definition of the word is the right standard for us to live by. And sin is the other way around. We set up our own false standards. You know, one of the things about preaching is that if you want to be effective, you better believe in what you're preaching, right? So for me, even after I share with you, I, I, I'm continually, I keep thinking about some of these things. And you recognize so much of the false standards that there are in the world today. And the right goal actually is for our life is to glorify God. I know some of these terms seems very religious, uh, glorify God. What does that mean? Actually, 
if you expand it further, to glorify God means you glorify anything that's associated with God, anything that is good, anything that is true, anything that is beautiful. In Chinese, it's called Zhen San Mei. What is true, what is good, what is beautiful. This is associated with God. So is your life a life that glorify God in that manner? Or do you glorify other things? Or you glorify yourself? And the right motive is actually when you do all this for the love of God. Again, it may sound pretty religious, and I will expand it further, for the love of anything that is true, anything that is good, anything that is truly beautiful. And of course, ultimately, it is for the love of God as well. And John Frame pointed out that actually when we look at all these things, you realize one thing that is very true, and that sin is irrational. That people continue to want to live with a false standard, false goal, false motive. Doesn't make any sense, but we still do it. And Man, I'm deeply uh, appreciative of this statement because of the work I do. It's just quite crazy. One of the biggest struggles in my ministry is to ask, why? Why would, why, why would people live like this? Or why would people do this? Why would people do that? Like, for example, every morning when I, every Saturday morning when I come here, I will park at the Lorong... What is that place called? The Bang Bangkok place? I'm not Bangkok, the Lingkok, one of the block 62, the car park, because I hate that turning round and round car park opposite this place. I'm always afraid of scratching the car. So I park in the HDB car park. And you know, by coincidence, always when I park, there will be this guy who just finished his exercise. And he will come and then he has this big black Mercedes Benz there. So as I arrive, he's about to leave. So he will come drenched, you know, really working very hard. You know what he will do? Every Sunday this happened. As I was going to come out of the car, he would take out a stick of cigarette he would smoke. And I look at him and I ask myself, you know, this guy must have telling himself that, wow, I work very hard, you know, I, I really go and work out, uh, whatever it is. And I, now I deserve a stick of cigarette to, to, to I don't know, reward myself. I don't understand how it works because you work so hard to maintain your health and then you you go for a stick of cigarette and he's like enjoying himself and all that. I mean, I know some of you smoke, I know. So as I always tell you, if you meet me on the street and you're smoking, you don't have to swallow your cigarette. It's okay. <laughs> you know, I understand it's, it's, a, it's a serious addiction, but it doesn't make sense, right? It's irrational. So a lot of the things we do in life really quite irrational. However, the good news, as we approach Good Friday, we are reminded again. Verse 5 tells us, even when we were dead in our transgressors, even if you do things that are irrational, that makes sense. He made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. The word grace means you don't deserve it. That's what it means. So if, if you deserve it, it's not called grace. It's called a transaction. So if you want to be gracious to someone, you need to do it to someone who cannot pay you back or don't expect it or really, in a sense, don't deserve it. If, if the fellow deserves it, he can pay you back. It's a transaction because you're doing something so that you get something back to you. So therefore, you know, in the charity world, there's this thing called corporate social responsibility. So corporations say, oh, we will give back to the society. But by the way, you must put my logo very big <laughs> here and there. Well, you know, if you're in charity, you do it because, hey, you know, money is money. But strictly speaking, that's not the best good, isn't it? Because it's a transaction. You want your logo bigger than everybody else or you go and name the building after yourself or whatever it is. So that's not true grace. Huh? But in the case of our Lord Jesus Christ, come on, you know, you completely do not deserve it. And Jesus Christ did that, died for us on the cross so that the coming ages, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. And God did that in the coming ages. Remember, this was written so long ago. So in the coming ages, all the way till Christ will come again, and we will see and meet people who demonstrate the immeasurable grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we ourselves, being his people, ought to be displaying this as well. And so I ask the same question. What about you? Do, do you feel that? Do you feel that this is just some superlatives that Apostle Paul write like a habit? Everything must, the Chinese use the word Zhang must, well, you know, well, immeasurable, infinite, all that. I tell you not so. Absolutely, he, he was right, the immeasurable. 
And, and so how come you don't feel it? Remember the answer, the monkey trap. Are you holding on to some coconut somewhere? <laughs> Remember the monkey trap? You will catch a monkey, get a coconut, drill a hole just nice for the monkey to put its hand inside. Put some candy, put some coconut inside, banana put inside. Monkey go in, grab the banana, refuse to let go. Because of that, cannot get out. Because, you know, the hole is just nice to go in but cannot come out. What would the monkey need to do? Very simple, just let go. But we don't. We won't let go. We just hold on stubbornly to whatever it is and we are trapped. And then we ask ourselves the question, how come I don't understand this immeasurable grace? Where is this? I don't see it. I mean, you keep talking about how you're happy and joyous and all that. I don't feel it. May I encourage you to look into your life and ask yourself, are you holding on to, I don't know, maybe 10 different coconuts, they're all very heavy and then you cannot get out of it. And verse 10 is an important verse. We are saying, and with that in mind, we move to the portion of Ephesians. Let's come to God in a word of prayer and commit the time into His almighty hands. Let us pray. We thank you, God, for being with us this morning, that you are with us because the Bible tells us that when two or more gather in the name of Jesus Christ, He will be with us. And so in faith, we know we are Aside everything that is blocking us from you, maybe it's our pride, maybe it's our failures, maybe whatever it is, help us to then be a little child before his heavenly father to look at you, look at your word and think carefully in our heart because we know that the Holy Spirit speaks to us through your word and through your unworthy servant as well. Help us to receive your word so that our heart be like good soil. You will take root and may your word bear fruit in our life, that people will see our action and give glory to the Father in heaven. Have special mercy on your unworthy servant. May the words of his mouth and the meditation in all our hearts and mind be deemed acceptable in your sight. For you are God and our Redeemer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now you have heard the response, uh, the scripture reading earlier from the chairperson, uh, prayerfully you will understand that it is a reminder to us all about the before and the after. And Ephesians 2 is a lot about this. The Apostle Paul kept reminding his reader that last time you were like this, now you are like that. And as we approach Good Friday, again we are reminded about the significance of the death of our Lord Jesus Christ on the cross and his subsequent resurrection, how earth-changing it is. But at the same time, all the things that the Bible described, all the brokenness and all that, they are still very much with us today, isn't it? And the world today is separated by so many problems that for me, sometimes you get really disturbed just reading the newspaper because of all these problems. But they are there with us. All the various isms in the world today. And there are so many that I can only highlight some of the more prominent ones. The, the few that really came to forefront in the past few months actually includes racism. And that's one of the things that the world is grappling with today. Especially in the United States of America, uh, people come up with all this black life. Like us, we are Chinese people, most of us, and of us are of other race, but I don't see any African American among us. So we sort of ask ourselves the question, I thought uh, all life matters. You know, in the United States, if you utter the word all life matter, people will go after you and say that you are racist. And it's very confusing. I, it's, uh, yeah, sure, well, all life matters. Asian life matters. And we are reminded, it was fascinating. Have you read this news, anyone? Yeah, this old woman got at, attacked by one white guy who, who punched another Chinese, uh, eight Vietnamese guy before and then after that went after this old woman. It's probably related to Ip Man or Bruce Lee or someone, right? Because she rag, grabbed a stick and whacked the fellow until the, the girl breach into cannot have to be sent to the hospital. You know, I thought, wow, this is really malu, man. You're so big white guy cannot whack by Chinese woman. And, and, and too bad the video did not capture the whacking. I would love to see it, you know. But he would have captured the end where he was about to be sent to hospital and somehow he flashed the middle finger at her right before he left. And she was using Cantonese and scolding her. Some of the words I was wondering whether I can repeat on the pulpit. I don't think so. Right? It's kind of vulgar. I got to say whatever it is kind of thing. And the family then went on the GoFundMe to talk about how Asians are being 
targeted in the United States. And they wanted to raise $45,000 for her medical fee. And in the end, they raised more than $1 million US dollar. It was just a crazy thing. And all the celebrities, Asian celebrities, come out and talk about how Asian life matters as well. Now, I'll tell you that, to be frank, I, I find this a little bit uh, exaggerated to some extent because we do not know whether the assailant is a mentally unsound person. And he, he is home, he's homeless. So chances are he's mentally unsound. American homeless are either drug addict, alcoholic, mentally unsound people, a lot of them, high per percentage. So I'm not certain whether it's just simply race or by coincidence, it just happened to any other whack people. You know, these people are not of sound mind. So I won't jump to a conclusion and say that it's Asian hate crime. One of the reasons is because I lived in America for almost four years as a student. I did not encounter any racism. There were so many decades ago, you know, when people are less enlightened. Uh, I remember the only time I really encountered was one time Patricia and I, she was my girlfriend back then. You know, we love children, right? So one time we were at the playground, this curly red hair girl was there, five-year-old, about there. La. So cute. So we went to disturb her, la, you know, hey, so cute, so cute. She stared at us and said, we do not like you, go back to China. <laughs> so, yeah, that's like, I was looking around whether the father is around, wanted to slap her, but, <laughs> but it's just a, just a kid. That's like the only time, you know. And, but of course, racism may not be so obvious moving forward. There are some that are more underlying and more insidious, right? For example, in India, recently there's a lot of discussion of whether ads like this are racist, where you have cream that whiten an Indian skin. A lot, I don't know, you know, it, it, is that they, but for the Chinese being fairer is uh, a bit cultural because we always like the kid to be pai pai nun nun, you know, white and all that. And they are naturally fair Chinese or especially the Dongbei people and all that, they are very fair. Some of you one look, I know you from Dongbei, you know, so fair people. So I, I suppose it's quite natural. But for Indians, it's a different ball game, right? Especially with the Tamil, they are dark skinned folks. So for their celebrities to go up and endorse whitening cream in India, display a latent sense of discrimination or segregation. And yes, some of the so-called things that we encounter in life have some racist, I, in my opinion, influence in there. For example, the charity that I serve, Habitat for Humanity, one of the gripes I always have is that we have been started since 1976, the Asia Pacific Vice President has always been an Angmo man, always. And I don't understand. Asia has won over be many billions of people. You tell me you cannot find one Asian. I don't believe you. You know what I mean? So it's the same old, they call it the white man's club or old, old, old white man. We we notice something about the leaders of Habitat for Humanity at the highest level. Number one, white man. Number two, bald man. They are all bald. Number three, all left-handed. I don't know. So I don't fulfill any of the criteria. I got a lot of hair, so cannot. Not white some more. So there are all these things hidden there. Other than racism, there is also issues relating to sexism. And sexism means that you are discriminated because of your gender. And you may be surprised this happens everywhere, including pretty advanced nation. England, for example, recently had this fascinating case. You know, they are fighting COVID, right? So they came out with a... Uh, poster, coronavirus, stay home, save lives. And immediately withdraw this ad very quickly because of public protest. Can you tell what's wrong with this poster? Yeah, because <laughs> some of the men, what's happening? Because the poster show that stay home, save life, all the caregiver are women. Uh, maybe you can't see from a far, this small little figure, they are all women. The women are doing the cooking, the women are taking care of kids, the women is cleaning up. The only male figure is on the left-hand side, sitting in the sofa, having a good time, you know. <laughs> so immediately, the, the uproar in the society and say, what is this, you know, you are saying that, you know, the man's job is to sit in the sofa and have a good time and, hey, where's my dinner? <laughs> Women are the ones who had to go and clean and scrub and do all kinds of things. So this is a latent form of sexism. But of have you, there are all these obstacles that are different for a man than for a woman. The number of CEOs with women and what have you, very different from the number of men. So it's like what I said about, 
even in a charity that I work for, all the white people, let alone women, you know what I mean? So sexism is a serious issue. Another ism out there that is very serious that we are all getting more aware of is a social divide in the world. This is a picture that I've shown you before, taken in Brazil, which as you know is now collapsing uh, because of the coronavirus situation being out of control. On the one side, you have slums uh, in Brazil. This is taken in the capital of Brazil. And social divide is a very, very serious issue all over the rise, all over the world, especially in developing countries with the rise of China, the United States of America and Russia and all that nationalistic favor, fervor is on the move. This is the headline of CNN uh, written by American-based media, you know, and from the Chinese angle, why should we listen to you? You are no better than us. And so my WhatsApp has been flooded by many people who send me all the snippet of China internal program in reaction to things like that. I don't know whether you receive things like that. Some of the uh, foreign affairs speaker telling the United States, you're not worthy because you have your own problem, blah, 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 blah. You have all these serious problems. Fascinating. But the forces are on the move. The latest is the boycott of any cotton that's produced by Xinjiang. If that were the case, all of you must be naked now because <laughs> like the cotton of Xinjiang is all over the world. And all this tip for that thing going around all over the world, telling us that, you know, you are either for us or you are against us. And of course, China is on the move. Its satellite is above Mars now and is able to transmit picture of Mars. So everybody is competing. The Indians are trying to do the same. It is just crazy. And I heard a, a latest news about North Korea. The North Korean dictator say that he also must send something into the space because all the nationalists are on the move. And But instead of Mars, he want to send something to the sun because nobody had done that before. Then people say, how do you do that? You know, the sun very hot. Eh? The North Korean dictator say, I'm not stupid. I will say at night, you know. So, <laughs> sorry, I'll just throw in a joke or two. <laughs> so in, <laughs> in the face of all these things, there are various people who attempt to want to do something about it, isn't it? Uh, because... We just can't let, let, let life be like this. Now, why is it that you can't let life be like this? In the Westminster Confession of Faith Shorter Catechism class, we actually touch on this. This is because we are fallen people. And one of the signs of being fallen, the Westminster used the word, is the want for righteousness. There is a desire for perfection because we are made by God. And so all over the world, don't care whether you're Christian or not, there is a want for Righteousness. In fact, that's a sign that you are a created being, not a product of evolution. Because if you are a product of evolution, who cares? Let everybody die. So long as Wah Hua the whole, I'm happy, is fine. But no. So all over the world, there are many, many movements that attempt to bring peace to the world, to solve all this ism. The one that is very close to my heart is the hippie movement in the 60s. Hippie movement because in the 60s because I remember it very well. So in the 60s, one of the most significant movements in the United States is people say that, hey, all these are horrible. Oh, we want world peace. We want to come together and achieve peace. And it was fueled by the emergence of the Beatles as a rock group, uh, marijuana, <laughs> sex, drugs, rock and roll, and all these things come together. And so there was a period of time, a bunch of people, many people, thousands of people say, we want to tune out the society. We want to have world peace. Everybody will enjoy each other regardless of race, language, religion, or gender, whatever. Let's just have free love everywhere. And so hippie movement occurred in the 60s. The hippie movement symbol is the one on the left. That's the symbol for peace. Do you know what it represents? It is a globe with a leg of a dove on it. The three-pronged thing is a leg of a dove because the dove represents peace. Very well designed. I love this logo and I remember this. But it went nowhere, isn't it? Because today I don't see any of you being hippie. <laughs> uh, you don't even wear psychedelic color, anybody, you know. And it doesn't work. And, and you don't see any old hippie anymore. A lot of them halfway go and become a banker or something <laughs> because you cannot survive. It, the whole system just wouldn't work. And of course, there are many people who also wanted to do something. And history is littered with many failed heroes of all kinds, political one, 
uh, entrepreneur one, even religious one. So many, too many to name, right? Sun Yat-san wanted to unite China. Mahatma Gandhi wanted to be great soul of the world. Nelson Mandela was once considered a terrorist. Uh, and and uh, Angela Merkel wanted the whole U European Union to, to work very well together. And all these have failed one way to, or the other. South Africa today is a complete mess. Britain has gone to a Brexit situation. Um, and of course, China, as you know, it's continued to split into so many different camps. And some are religious gurus that want to bring world peace. This one on the top right-hand corner is the hugging saints of the world. A Hindu guru lady, uh, her name is very long. I don't want, don't want to attempt to pronounce it, but she's also known as Ama, which is a very shortened form. So her job is to go, not her job, but her ministry is to go around the world to hug people, to bring world peace. And she has come to Singapore a few times, you know. So the, uh, then people queue up to be hugged by her for a couple of seconds to promote peace. And that's what her, her work is. is a part of Hindu concept, she's considered a hugging saint of India. And to my horror, one time after translating for Dr. Tong, somebody stopped me and said that he went to be hugged by Amma. <laughs> and well, he was very, very excited and kept telling me that, wow, you know, this is wow, wonderful. It is like, I feel peace and what have you. I really wanted to tell him, hey, wrong religion. Uh, you know, we, we just did this whole uh, complicated profound Christian theology thing. Now you tell me that you just went to be helped by a Hindu guru, you know, with all due respect. All this really lead us to nowhere. So here comes Ephesians 2. The Apostle Paul highlighted that there are divisions and a before and a after situation. After talking about sin, after talking about the great grace we have received from our Lord Jesus Christ, he circled back and said, therefore remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hand. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Nationalism, all kinds of ism, segregated a group of people away from the people of God. And this because in the Bible, from the progressive revelation of God, we know that the will of God was first revealed to the Jews, the Israelites. And we know this because in Exodus 6 that we have done before. God know that I am the Lord your God who has brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptian. So the Israelites were the designated people who were first receive the will of God and be considered the people of God with covenant of God. And that's how God revealed his will. And of course, later on, we realized that the true Israel, all of us belong to the true Israel. But back when Paul wrote this, the segregation was very clear. The Jews are the people of God and they are marked by circumcision. And this is a physical mark from the time of Abraham till today. So all the Muslims we know, all the Jews we know are circumcised people because the, the Old Testament rule of the mark of circumcision carry on all the way till today. And how do you know who is a Gentile? A Gentile is a person non-Jew, very simple, black and white. You are either a Jew or you are a Gentile and they are therefore not the people of God. So when David faced Goliath, the, the Palestine, the giant Goliath, and David was just a boy. David said to Goliath in 1 Samuel chapter 17, I believe, Who are you? You are the uncircumcised person who dare to defy the armies of the Lord of hosts. So the word uncircumcised and, 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 and to be despised. Despised are they. The Gentiles are, were created as fuel for hellfire. That's what the Jews would say eh, back in the days of Paul. And they also would say that if you see a snake and a Gentile, you should crush the serpent and kill the Gentile. Now today, this kind of statement is still around, you know. Uh, I have heard racist statement about this. Let's say you don't like whatever race, lah, X, Y, Z. So the statement is, if you see a snake and you see a X, Y, Z, what do you do? 
the answer you kill X, Y, Z first. You know, that's the kind of very racist kind of way. And yeah, the Jews had actually had that. I think till today is still the case. If you see a Gentile woman in childbirth, you should not help her because she will give birth to another Gentile and then pollute the world even further. And if a Jew visit a Gentile house, it immediately make him ceremoniously unclean. And then he has to go for repentance and things like that. And horrors of it all, if a Jew dare to marry a Gentile woman, they will conduct a funeral immediately for that Jew because he's now way the Jews were treated back in the days of our Lord Jesus. Uh, the Gentiles were treated back in the days of our Lord Jesus Christ. But remember that Jesus did it the other way around. Right? In many of his parables, he used the Samaritans as an example. And he never rejected any one of them, even in his miracles of healing. So what do are important, of course, because you are a child of God. But you see, historically, Paul was declaring at that time uh, something they were never heard before, you know, that the whole group of people has been brought back to God and the revelation of God's will was made clear to our Lord Jesus Christ. So actually, I always, always say that the gospel, you know, that not so simple. When we first understand it, it's like, oh, okay, we're simple. I'm going to be a Christian all that. The more you meditate upon it, the more you read God's word, you realize that it's, it's nothing short of earth-shaking. So all the immeasurable, infinite, this greatest of all kind of uh, terms, they are all very, very appropriate. And not only that, we are also reminded from this passage that when we use the word Gentiles or us uncircumcised, it's not just about physical difference or people of a different race. The Bible here is talking about people who really belong to Christ and people who do not belong to Christ. So those who belong to God, the Jews, the people of God, including us, the true Israel, all who belong to God. And so the word Gentile actually referred to people who do not belong to God. And that includes Jews huh, who do not believe in God. So you need to understand in this manner. And the Bible then make it very clear later in Galatians 6, 15. The Apostle Paul says, For neither circumcision counts for anything or uncircumcision, but a new creation. So the Bible is saying that at one time, the world is segregated into just two groups. One group that belongs to God and one group that does not belong to God. And forevermore, these two groups are segregated. But because of Jesus Christ, a new creation has happened. And there is a route then back to God. And how was this done? Verse 14 says, It is done for He Himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken now in His flesh the dividing wall of hostilities. So the world is broken. So many isms all over the place, so many problems. Individually, we are broken. And as a, as a group, as a whole gang in the world, broken into so many, many pieces. And here comes Jesus Christ, our peace. Unlike the failed heroes, failed movement of the world, Jesus Christ actually is not one of the ways, one of the truth, one of the lives. We are very familiar in the second responsive reading. John 14, 6, Jesus said to him, which is Thomas, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except to me. You know, all the failed heroes and movements of the world are people who, because they are fallen like us, just as one for world peace. And so they did. But they are just one of the minor ways. And whatever they are sharing is just one of the minor truths. And as exemplary the life could be, it's not perfect life. It's just one of the many good lives. But here it's very clear. The Bible declared Jesus himself as himself. And herein lies one of the history and theological understanding that influenced me greatly in my life. The understanding of God as the ultimate source of all things. So yesterday our brother Kevin got married with sister Edna and so I conducted the wedding and I was sharing with them. They picked from 1 John chapter 4, the verses, we love because he first loved us. And above that is the verse, God is love. So, you know, it's not God is loving. God is compassionate. God is merciful. Now, all religions say that. All religions say that the most merciful, most whatever, whatever. 
only the Bible of the Christian faith say. It's not just that, no. God is love in itself. So here the same. It's not like Jesus came to bring you peace. That he has some methods for you to achieve peace. No. He is the peace in itself. He himself is our peace. And this is why he will succeed where everybody will feel, where every movement will feel, where every heroes of the world will feel. I mean, they are well-meaning and what have you, but they will fail because he himself is our peace. How did he become our peace? The answer comes a few days later when we remember Good Friday. For he has made us both one. The Jews and the Gentiles are now one. He has broken down his flesh Using the broken flesh that he has, the dividing walls of the ism among us are now broken down. But the most important one is the dividing wall between us and God. This is also broken. So as we approach Good Friday, we are reminded again by Ephesians how huge a contrast it is. So therefore, truly, in the Christian faith, in Jesus Christ, our peace, you will find the true answer that breaks all the ism and all the differences away. This is why Paul would say in Galatians 3, 28, There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Do you know how big and revolutionary this declaration is? In the time of Jesus Christ, when he wrote something like this, the slaves are... Man, goodness, these people are like objects to buy and, that you buy and sell in the market, you know. The women also, they have no place. Was alone the Gentiles. I already show you what they say about the Gentiles. So now Paul come here and declare to you that, hey, by the way, uh, you know, there is nothing, no segregation anymore. It's akin to us today looking at your Bangladeshi foreign worker on the street and say that, hey, you know, it's same with me. We don't think like that, right? Or that poor domestic helper that worked for you, that, you know, you are the same with me. We also don't think like that, right? This is like the dirty little secret of Singapore, you know. We are like with a prosperous country. Behind this prosperous country, there are so many women who came from so many poor countries being tortured and starved and beaten. It's, it's a shame to us as a society, isn't it? I don't know. I really don't know where to hide my face when I see all these stupid things that's happening. And, you know, we as a society is just, this is terrible. The, 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 the parasite show should be about us. I get a bit agitated with this because recently in, in Habitat, I had to deal with this issue. The, the, the authority is coming after, coming after us. You know why? Because we did this huge project in Cambodia to help the Cambodians lah, to the tune of 10 million US dollars. I raised the money. 10 million US dollars. You know what happened? When that happened, my books still, because now the government look at my books and they say, hey, you are helping foreigners more than you're helping Singaporeans, you know. We cannot have that. And they say, what does that mean? Huh? Does that mean you won't give me tax exam receipt? They say, no. We will suspend your charity status. I said, huh? What does that mean? Because charity to us means we help our own people only. I, said, I, I don't... Hello, excuse me. Kong Tzu Echi Pai, what terrible, never hear puppy. He said, by our definition, charity means you help Singaporeans only. I say, you, you, what kind of dictionary you use? Uh, excuse me, I, I don't quite understand this. And by the way, the help that we give to Cambodia is just money, right? We send the money. I'm... I, I go there and inspect the projects here and there, I mean, before the COVID. But I'm not the one who is doing the show, it's the Cambodians. My staff in Singapore, generally speaking, are serving the poor in Singapore. You know what's the answer? Oh, when you serve the poor in Singapore, we cannot measure, ma. we don't know. So we, we only count by dollar and cents. So you can spend the 24 hours helping the poor, but you have the poor free, like Hardy, I asked him to go and visit the prison or that. They don't count because they don't pay you, okay? But I, I sent $10 to Cambodia, so I'm helping the Cambodians 
and I'm not helping Singaporean. I, wah, you know, even when I say here, my blood pressure is going up. It's, it's just, <sighs> are you crazy? But that's the way we are. We are fallen people. And this is why forever and ever and ever, you're going to see all these maids being tortured or whatever it is. Because after this, you know, wow, very poor thing. Uh, wow, they're very tough. Uh. Hey, what's for dinner? Uh? We don't get it, right? In Christ Jesus, there is no segregation at all. And we are far, far away from understanding this biblical truth. The only way you can really, really understand this, if you truly understand the significance of Good Friday, the Apostle Paul went on to talk about how this is done. How is this done? He said in verse 15, Jesus Christ did this by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances, that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostilities. What Paul meant was this. Jesus Christ, by dying on the cross for us, all of us, regardless of your race, your gender, your social background, and yes, including regardless of your whatever religion you think you believe in, the first thing that Christ has done is that he created a reconciliation between us and the Father. That's what he means. His broken body paved the way back between us and our Father. And that's the most important thing. And because of that, all the hostilities and the dividing line between men has been broken down. And then we have peace with others. And this forms the cross. So the cross is always going to be a reminder to us all that we are first reconciled with God by Jesus Christ. And because of that, we can have reconciliation with others. Now, all the failed heroes of the past don't understand this. Well, I suppose Dr. Sonja San understood it because he's a Christian, but he was not a very serious Christian, actually. I think he got more than one wife kind of thing back in these days. So, but the true peace can only come from the peace himself, right? I mean, he is your peace. How in the world can you achieve peace when that peace himself is ignored? It cannot be. So first, the reconciliation between us and God gives us peace with God. And second, it will then result in peace with others, forming the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Reconcile. One side say this, one side say that. Gong suo gong you li, po suo po you li. As Stephen Tong say, always chi you chi li, or, or everybody. How do you get them to reconcile? You find a peacemaker, isn't it? Somebody will come in and, and make peace and say, hey, you know, my any kwan la, my any kwan la, biao kin la, all that. Why would they listen to the peacemaker? The answer is, they, you must find someone both respect. They, they both were honor, right? Because the two of them are, are fighting, whether in business or in, in whatever it is. They, they just won't listen to anyone. So you find the peacemaker, and because they won't listen to anyone, at least they listen to the peacemaker in the same manner. When you have issues in life, lack of peace with anyone, you find that I, 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 I can't do this, you know. But if you find me someone whom I love, I will look at this someone whom I love. And because I love this person, therefore I will be able to do whatever it is you ask me to do. By myself, I cannot do it. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, herein lies the secret of peace in our life. And that is, you must recognize who is the one with the peace. And you must know that it's not you but the Prince of Peace himself. He is the peace. And when you are focused on loving the Prince of Peace, then you can do all things through him that gives you strength. So what is it in your life that is in trouble now, may I ask? Could it be your marriage? You have a big problem every day fighting. Could it be your workplace? You have a lot of stress, a lot of issue. You think that people don't look People look you know up and you know you're very frustrated, struggles with 
financial issue. The only one that's really challenging to me, in my opinion, is health issue. That are tough, you know, I acknowledge it, relationship issue. What is it? What is the way out? I tell you, the way out is to recognize who is your peace in life. And yes, by yourself, you can't do it, but by recognizing him, you can. Just yesterday, I was discussing to, with one sister after the wedding of a case that we are both uh, familiar with. And she said something that tells me that this lady is close to Jesus Christ. She said that my observation is that many of the people from Indonesia especially, they come to Singapore and work here and live here. They try to solve the problems by their own strength. And they all fail. But those who solve problems based on the strength of God and the revelation of the Bible will succeed. And I say, yeah, this one close to God. She understands. What she meant is that, you know, a lot of us, we live our life coming here, living in Singapore with a lot of cultural identity. Yes, I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian in the GREE. Reform Evangelical Church, hated by Stephen Tong, blah, blah, blah. This is our, our labor, our culture. But the reality is that I have my own thing. One person I, I talked to tell me that, you know, she was arguing with her mother. And her mother told, and she told her mother, but Pastor Yong said, the Bible said this, this, this. She said, my mother tell me, who cares what Pastor Yong say? We are Chinese. You must listen to your mother because... Xiao Dao Wei Xian, filial piety number one. Ah. So, whatever God say, whatever the Bible say, whatever, li e tai ji. I have my own culture, I have my own being. I am who I am. I do my own thing. That's where the problem is. So, yesterday when I was sharing with a young couple, I brought up the example that we always say. You have God in your life, in your marriage, you have a husband and you have a wife. How do both of you get close to each other? Hey, looking at the picture, you're quite far away. You get close to each other when both of you move closer and closer to God. And that's our understanding. Yes, in marriage prep class, I will share with the couple some of the things and the lessons we learned, some of the things that you should do. Like, for example, when you fight, what you should do, what you should not say, you know, things like that how you, when you deal with your in-laws and all that, don't always take their word for it. When your mother-in-law say, never mind, never mind, people come, can no need to bring anything. Don't believe her, you know. It's not true one, you know. Whatever it is, play safe, always buy something, you know, that kind of thing. But those are minor things. Ultimately, your marriage is going to work well if both persons continue to grow in our Lord Jesus Christ and get closer and closer to God and you get closer and closer to each other. Because there will be times where you look at each other and then you say, Alama, my Bachu ta stem, I don't know why I marry you. Uh, that time, half blind or whatever. So they always say that love is blind and marriage is the great healer of blindness. You know, so my eyes are now open. I should have married you or whatever. By your own strength, you can't do it. But if you are a person who is close to God, you will look at the Bible and the word of God will tell you to hey, you better wake up your idea don't do this then because you love Jesus Christ you then would turn to your wife or your husband and say the three I patented Yong Ting Ming I love you what what is the next one Alama I'm very disappointed all my class students I am sorry and the last one is I forgive you by yourself Cannot say one. How to say eh, ah, eh, ah, eh. Cannot come out. But if you love Jesus Christ, then you will. So herein lies the problem, right? Do you love God? That's the ultimate question. Do you? Or are you just relying on your own strength, do your own thing in your life? Don't care what the pastor say, don't care what the Bible say. Okay, lah, very interesting like here and there. And after that, I do my own thing. I am who I am. Do you understand that you are no longer who you are? Because Good Friday is the day that reminds you that you have been bought with a heavy price. So it is said that the more you understand the sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ on the cross, 
the more you understand why is it that you should love Him and love God. And if you love Jesus Christ with all your heart, and as the Bible says, that's the biggest thing to do, uh, to love God, or your heart, or your mind, or your soul, or your strength. You truly do that. It will then translate to peace in your own life and to those who are around you. And this is so important that the Apostle Paul said in verse 17, And he came and preached peace to you who were far off, and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access to the Spirit, to the Father. True peace can only be found in our Lord Jesus Christ. And just as Jesus came to preach his peace, not only to the people from, for himself, to people who are near, he also preached the peace to people who are far off, certainly through his apostles. This is why we are Reformed Evangelical Church. We share this peace to people who are far off and people who are near. Now, I started off saying that, you know, there are many people who fail in this and many movements that fail in this. Does that mean that we will succeed in the world? The answer is no, because the Bible has a pessimistic view of the future of the world. Although the world will never ever find true peace without our Lord Jesus Christ, at the very least, those of us who do belong to Him can and must live out this peace in our life. And this is not your usual peace. What gifts do I give to you? Not your heart be troubled, neither let them be afraid. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, is your heart troubled this morning? Are you afraid? Are there things in your life that is seemingly unsolvable? It's like, my goodness, you know, there's so much issue and so much dysfunctionality or problems or whatever it is. May I encourage you, as I said last week, to look into your life and ask yourself whether you are in some kind of a monkey trap, some coconut thing that's hanging around. Could be your stubbornness, could be you holding on to the things of the world, could be you thinking that your culture or your whatever intelligence is better than anything else. You need to let that go and take on the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ and not the peace of the world. For the peace of the world will not work. While it is true that the world will continue to spiral out of control, I am convinced beyond all doubt that for the people of God, we can and we must exemplify this peace in our life. For those of you who are married among us, you must exemplify the love and teachings of Jesus Christ in a joyous and happy marriage. Not by your own strength, but by loving Jesus Christ and by loving Him, then by the extension of that love, love the person that you have made a vow to for good or for worse, in sickness and in health. Whether in rich or whether you are poor, to walk the journey together, exemplifying the love of Christ in your life. And for those of us who are single, that too must be the mode of operation for you in life. To live a life where you love God so much that that love spill out to the people all around you. For He is our peace. There is no other peace. If you attempt to achieve peace in any other way, you will surely fail. As we approach Good Friday then, may we remember this deeply in our heart and love Jesus for he has loved us so much that he's willing to die excruciatingly painful death on the cross for us so that we will be his people and he will be our God. Let us pray. We thank you, O oh God, for speaking to us through your word. Indeed, it is true that more often than not, we rely on our own strength and our own ways to achieve peace in our life, and we fail miserably because we are flawed, of course, and fallen. And yet we continue to listen to all the voices of the world telling us what to do, that pop song by whoever, that book written by some guru, 
that drama show we watch telling us what's the values we should hold on to instead of your word. We thank you that the Apostle Paul pointed out that Jesus is not just one of the way to peace, but he is our peace. He is the peace. And he himself said that he has come so that we are not going to just have the second-rated broken peace system of the world, that we embrace the source of peace himself. So here lies the question then, do we really love you? That's why it's the greatest of all commandments, that we must love you with all our heart, with our soul, with our mind and with our strength. And by so doing then, we can love our neighbours as ourselves. Remind us always, O oh God, that the love of God is the chief goal in our life so that we glorify you in everything that we do and enjoy you forevermore. But of course, we are weak people, stubborn, stiff-necked. So we continue to pray for strength and a willing heart to follow our Lord Jesus Christ truthfully, letting go of all the monkey traps in our life, slowly but surely, so that we will exemplify the abundant life that you have come to give to us. Listen to our prayers. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.